do one thing first to begin. I see all of you spread out all over the place. Move up. Be comfortable next to each other. Come on, let's move up. That way I don't have to raise my voice. Uh, I can hear everybody. I'm getting old, so... Don't worry, the teachers are not going to bite you. Cool, very good, this is much better. I can see everybody. Cool. Alright, so let me explain the, uh, just give you a bit of a reason for this mic. If you have any questions, I will ask you to just go to the mic and ask the questions so that everybody can hear you. Myself included. So, uh, how many of you came to the concert last night? Raise your hand. Alright, very good, very good. Uh, so before we get started with the subject of the lecture that I'm, that I'm giving today. I want to just start with a few minutes and see if you guys have any questions about me. I don't know if any of you have gone and uh, Googled me or anything of that nature, uh, but if you have any questions about me and about my past or present, now is the time. I was impressed by how many pretty big name American composers you know and have worked with, and I'd be curious how that happened. How it happened? Uh, that you met them in formal sure. relationships. And... Uh, well, let me just start by saying that, similar to all of you, uh, I grew up, I studied music with classical composers. Bach. Beethoven, Haydn, Schumann, Chopin, Rachmaninoff, uh, Scriabin, you name it, I've done it. Uh, in 2001, uh, when I came to the United States, um, I joined the University of Kansas. So for those of you that, that, that love sports, I'm a Jayhawk. Um, and the band director at the time, uh, Professor John Lynch, he was needing a pianist for Porky and Bess. He sent an email to the whole piano department asking for a volunteer. Guess what? I was the only one. So uh, that created an opportunity for me, um, and I played with the Wind Symphony for about three years at Kansas two years at Texas Christian. That's how I discovered American living composers. Here's the trick, uh, and we may come back to that later. In our business, uh, in, our, in our performing business, when you go to concerts, you will notice that most presenters love featuring traditional composers, and they hate anything modern. Why is that you think? Anyone have something to do? Doesn't matter which one. Go. The more traditional composers, their names are more recognizable if you draw the crowd. Yes, exactly. Traditional composers are more recognizable. What were you about to say? I was going to say playing modern music is risky. Is what? It's risky. You don't know. It's related to what you said. Yeah. Here's the reason. Money. It's simple as that. Money. Why? Well, uh, let's just take the example of a concert series or even a small orchestra. Their job is to get seats, to get people on, that, on those seats. Their job is to get tickets sold. What sell tickets the most? Rachmaninoff, Beethoven. Chopin, Brahms. Just to give you an example. Uh, the only problem with modern music is still money. It's very simple. You have to buy the music. You have to rent the music. You have to find a performer that knows the music. 
That's an additional expenses. So, uh, and if, like I said, I'm not going to go much on that because that's a different subject. Uh, but to come back to the question, uh, wind symphonies have, by, by the nature of the, of the repertoire, uh, more, uh, more willingness to feature modern composers. It just imposed that. So, uh, as a member of the Wind Symphony, I've played Maslanka, David Maslanka, uh, Balkum, uh, I'm losing track of my name, Grantham, Welcher, I've probably done thousands of those. So, that, that's how I got into, uh, into American living composers. And uh, to, to for the answer, it, uh, one of the reasons, the primary reasons, my repertoire is for recitals as American living composers is because we need to differentiate ourselves from everybody else. If you're in a, in a music business, you can't go around presenting the same thing, the same way. And the other problem, which well, I was talking with Professor Mentha yesterday, is critics. When you play a Beethoven sonata, everybody has their own opinion about what is to be done, how is to be done, what's the dynamic, what's the articulation. Guess what? I don't have to deal with that. I don't. The only person I have to answer to, well, there are two, really, myself and a composer. That's it. So, that, that's how I got into American living composers. Um, but really the big one, it's a way for me to be different. Uh, it's a way for me to attract attention uh, from presenters, because we are not many pianists at all that do that. Especially only that. So. Next. Any other questions about me? Or are we moving on? One time? Yes. I'm sorry, what brought you to America? Uh, the question was what brought me to America? Well, family. Family. Uh, my mom and my stepfather are both musicians. Uh, my mom plays for the Delta Symphony. My dad for the Kansas City Symphony. And they're both Czechs. Uh, and so, in 99, um, they decided as a family, more like parents really, that they needed to be a, we needed to move to here, to the United States. I needed a change at the time too, as well, you know. Uh, I've spent about 10 years in France, you know. I needed some change as well, so that's how I ended up uh, in, uh, in the United States. You know, first in Missouri. Uh, then obviously Kansas, Texas, and so yeah, that's all. Next, anybody else? That's two, yes? How many languages do you speak? I speak two languages only. English and French. That's it. Um, she, uh, Professor, I mentioned that I was born in Bulgaria. That's correct. I left Bulgaria when I was nine years old, ten years old. So I grew up in France. I speak French fluently. I write fluently. I can teach. I in a whole nine years. But yeah, it's French and English only. Last call. Anybody else? No. All right. Let's move on to the lecture. Good. Uh, so when uh, I was talking with Professor Meth about these events, she mentioned that uh, it would be an interesting topic to cover how to start a career in the music business. So let's first do a bit um, you know, of a show of hands here. How many of you are wanting to pursue a performing career? Raise your hand. Be sure, don't be sure, raise your hand still. 
Uh, good, very good. How many of you are looking to pursue career in teaching? Music teaching, specifically. Okay. How many of you are looking for music therapy or in that type of nature? Anybody? How about recording? Okay. How about church music? Good, quite a variety. Very good. Very good. Uh, or for the, my points here are mostly directed toward performers because that's where I'm at. Uh, you can, everybody can use it. Everybody. Doesn't matter what, uh, what goals you're pursuing. So, let me, and I'm going to start with a simple question here which I'm going to come back to last night. Before one of the pieces, uh, before the Saunders piece, um, I mentioned websites. So, how many of you here have their own websites? Professional websites. Facebook does count if you have a Facebook page. Facebook page, not profile. And we'll come back to that. Oh, very good, very good. So why am I raising this point? Uh, in this day and age, you want to be found, you have to be on the web. You want to be heard, you have to be on the web. Nobody's going to give you a call in the middle of the day asking for your record. Or for the lecture you did three days ago. They want to go to YouTube, they want to go to Facebook, they want to go to LinkedIn, sometimes, or to your website, and listen directly, and then contact you if they want to. So that's the first thing. You want to do, and I know it's going to sound a bit out and aggressive, you want to succeed, you have to have a website. You can't go out without it. There's no way. No way. So that's one. Now this brings me my next question, because I know you raised your hand. How many of you know the difference between a Facebook page and a Facebook profile? Alright, would somebody come in and explain? Anybody? Or should I? I guess I'm going to. Alright, go ahead, go ahead. Let's make it interactive. Facebook profile is to become friends with. Um, and a Facebook profile or page is liked, and a Facebook page is followed for um, the express purpose of keeping in touch with whatever brand or company or whatever that page is associated with. Whereas a profile is a personal thing for people to get in touch. Very good. Very good. He's right. Here's the trick. Here's the trick to know about Facebook. First of all, Facebook changes their policy day in, night out. You can wake up tomorrow morning and they've changed their terms of use. So, that's one. Uh, second, they have restricted the way Facebook pages function. In a sense that you can have all of these guys on your Facebook friends list, but if they don't like your page, you can't inform them of what you do. That's a problem. So, what I always recommend for Facebook is use your profile as your business. Don't, don't post your pictures. You can post your demo progress comments if you like. Uh, you're going to get plenty of response from chiefs, from patriots, you name it. Uh, but that would be the primary option to communicate on Facebook. Why? Because when you add people on Facebook as friends, and then you create events, you connect to them directly. You can message them at any time, day in and day out, with any events that you guys are doing. Does it make sense? Um, one thing that I did actually for Colorado, I don't have any contacts in Colorado, 
except for capital band down in Baltimore. So what I did is, well, I found, I added Professor Morland, I added Professor Morland to my Facebook uh, friends list. Now I can see who she has as friends from Colorado. I can add people that I want to add to my friends list and invite them to my events. Automatically. They don't have to know. They just have to accept my friend request. Does it make sense? Okay, cool. Very good. Now, before we continue, any questions on website and Facebook? Anybody? One, two, moving on. Cool. All right, good. Uh, and we'll still talk a bit about the website, but more about what you need to have available. What do you all think you should have available for presenters, for potential employers? What materials do you think would they need? Anybody? Preferably a student. A calendar of upcoming events that they can come to. Okay. What else? Um, your contact info. What else? Samples of your work. That's in the musical examples in a kind of event. What else? On your website? Uh-huh. Um, I'm not uh, like waste, I guess I already said contact. Here's the contact. Uh, you get three of the big ones. Okay. Very good, very good. Well, let me go down the list. You need your resume up and running. In a PDF format, preferably. Downloadable. No, you don't want for a presenter or an employer to have to give you a call for you to mail the material. In this day and age, most presenters like electronic, usually. So you want your resume. How you do your resume? I'll leave that up to you guys. You can look at your local uh, career advisor. You can talk to them. You can see how that's done, but you need that. Second, if you're a performer, a repertoire list. A presenter needs to see what do you play, what do you sing, what type of music, what type of composers. Now, let me, let me just address the repertoire for a second. In saying this, you can put any music on it, whether you know it or not. Why? Well, very good, but it's very simple. Presenters plan their seasons one year ahead of time. By the time you get to that concert, you have plenty of time to learn that music. So if you're a singer, you can put very well Verde Requiem or Mozart. Does it, you don't have to know it. And if they engage you, guess what? Normally you have six months to a year to learn it. Normally. So, put your repertoire. Then the next thing that comes in, that's going to help you with your name recognition, is business cards. You have to have business cards. You can get them for free, by the way, you don't have to pay. If you go to Vista Print, have you guys been to that website yet? Anybody? Okay. They give you 150 for free or just shipping a Yami or something. Uh, if you do the uh, just the basic formatting, so you just easy. So that's one. Now, uh, so let's you know. We'll, We'll talk about this in a few couple of minutes, but so that's what you need to have basically. Now, related again to the materials that you need to have to the website and the technology. Let me show 
an example. And I'm going to use my website as an example. Didn't say no better. So this is my website. And normally when you get to that thing, there's music playing in the background. That's what reads the presenter when you are looking at. That's by the way, some songs number two for a transcription for piano or music. Stop that. Good. So why am I showing you this? In this day and age, you need to keep the visitors on your website as long as you possibly can. You want for a presenter to get to be on your website looking at every one of your pages. What does that mean? You have to have your website well organized. It's very simple as that. You can't have a messy website like a, a blog from Google or whatever else. It has to be well organized. So, what do you need to have? Well, it's very simple. Home page. That's where the presenter sees day in and day out when they go in. The home page, depending on who is your host, has different features. Calendar, upcoming events, pictures, you name it. The next thing you need is your biography. Well-written biography. If you have problems with the English grammar, please go see your creative writing. Uh, hey, I must give this to you guys. Okay? My English is not my first language. So I'm the first one to make mistakes by then. So check your bio, check your wordings, and then post that. Then, like you said, calendar of events has to be up to date. You cannot leave a website, especially if you want to get engagements, empty with events dating way back to 10 years ago. Photos, pictures. So, pictures, let me address that. Because I know we're getting a bunch of interesting pictures. Always professional pictures. Let me repeat this. Professional pictures. We don't need weird pictures of drinking and party. We got that? Cool. Cool. Very good. Now, uh, obviously, you need MP3s and, and videos. Those are very important. How many of you are going to... Well, let me ask you this. How many of you have their recitals here recorded? Their performances recorded here? One. Anybody else? Two. Okay. Everybody of you, every one of you should. Doesn't matter if you want to be a performer, doesn't matter if you want to be a music teacher, or you want to do music therapy or music education, it doesn't matter. Record your performances. Two reasons. One, you can listen to yourself and correct your mistakes. Two, the best performances, you can showcase them. You can share them on your website, on Facebook, LinkedIn, anywhere in the world. So I would recommend strongly, next time you do a performance by yourself or a compliment, whatever, record yourself. Record yourself. Okay? The, it's very easy. He, he, can, he can do it for you if you ask him, I'm sure. Uh, but you don't need a heavy equipment. You just need an iPhone or an Android, okay? So make sure to record your performances, be it in MP3 or videos, by the way. 
Uh, and regarding videos, I would recommend to have videos edited before posting them. Okay? If you take a break between your syncing, cut the break. If you if you are switching gears, you know, like uh, I did last night with my drinking water and such, cut that. They don't need to see you drinking water or changing or whatever, right? Cool. Ah, uh, good. Uh, now, here we come the big one, the big one. And then, uh, like I did last night, let me take a small drink. So, now the big one, which is the one I'm... <laughs> uh, many people know about me doing this, uh, because uh, I'm very aggressive about it. So, let me ask you this. You want to be a music teacher. You want to be performing on stage. Uh, rock mind, if you want to see West Side Story, it doesn't matter. How do you get a hold of the person in charge to get an engagement. What do you need to do for that? Anybody? Do you even know what I'm talking about here? Anybody? What I'm talking about is PR, self promotion. Having a website, having Facebook, having YouTube is all fine and good. But unless you contact the people, they're not going to find you. What do you do? Yeah. You sing. Okay. Soprano, alto? Soprano. I'm just, don't, don't, don't get, don't get uh, offended. I'm just taking your example because you're not informing me. Uh, yeah, soprano, guess what? How many sopranos do you think we have in the world? A lot. Guess what? Do you think a presenter from New York is going to look specifically for you, unless they know about you? Exactly. That's exactly the point. So, what do you do? Well, I'm going to give you my example. I'm what I call very aggressive. I like to call it legal harassment. <laughs> very simple. It's very simple. It doesn't involve anything but email and phone calls. I'm not going to anybody's home place or workplace. I don't have time for that, first of all. So, the way it works is very simple. And you can do it for voice, you can do it for music, for teaching, you can do it for anything. Go on Google. Google the presenters that you need. For example, voice recitals. For example, music teaching in Kansas or Canada, doesn't matter. Get that contact information. Every website by a presenter, be it university, college, school district, performing arts organization, has a contact information. They have to. They are legally obliged to have something. And most of them have the specific contact for every person, from executive director to the chairman of the School of Music to the piano professor to everybody. So what you do is you take the person that you need. In my case, I usually go for the chair of the piano department. In, his, in this case, it was Professor Menf. Or for the executive director, or for the music director, if I have information. I hate administrative paperwork. <sighs> if they could get rid of that one, but I go straight to the source, to the, to the decision makers. It doesn't matter if they send somebody else to talk to me, I want for them to see me. I want for them to hear me, see what I'm doing, and such. 
So that you go straight to the source. Uh, and really, that's the way I do it. Every day, I get up at 8 a.m. sharp, 9 a.m. Uh, Central Time, 8 a.m. Colorado Time. Uh, and the first thing I do is I send about 10 to 15 emails. Or make phone calls if the correct time zone. Every day. And if, if let's say, one of the persons on doesn't respond, well, guess what? 15 days later, they get the same email. But this time, I'm adding the person about it. That way, you have the person in turn and the person above seeing the same thing. And I continue making make phone calls. So that's why I like it. It's really door to door if you, if you think about it. Uh, it's what I call self promotion. Because nobody's going to do it for you. Simple as that. And they have a question. And that's going to allow me to take a break. All right, good afternoon, Mr. Yeah. August. Um, well, for. That was short. All right. So, for you, I'm guessing that'll be a lot easier because your name is well known. So, if they do see like your name and the subject of an email is like, and it's from you, it's like, oh my goodness, this is Mr. So and So, and he actually wants to talk to me. That's great. But like for me, who is well, virtually unknown to the world for now, but it's like, they, they have no idea who I am, once again, for now. When I'm just starting off, how, what advice would you give in this door-to-door -door thing? Like, sure. well, besides the don't give up, because that's kind of... That's the primary thing. <laughs> let, 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 me, let, let me address this, uh, to respond to his question. I didn't start that way. As a matter of fact, uh, think about this one, up until 2000 and, I want to say 2011, I didn't even have those pictures. All my pictures were pictures that I took with friends out that I just cropped from them and used for myself. Okay? I didn't start the way I'm at right now. Okay? I started exactly what you're talking about. Exactly. Um, I got in full time into this in 2008. 2008. Full time. Because before that I was uh, doing, well, my bachelor obviously at Kansas and my graduate at uh, TCU, Texas Christian. So I didn't have much time to deal with specific, you know, the right thing. Uh, so I started in 2008. The advantage that I had is that my focus from the very beginning was American living composers. So composers from universities would hear about me from other people and they would call me or email me to play their pieces. Or to write a piece for me. As a matter of fact, in my 2008, in my first year full time, uh, a composer from the University of Miami, Florida, wanted to write a piece for me out of the blue, because she heard from me from one of the faculties of Texas Christian, and so I had to go perform at the uh, University of Miami, Florida. Uh, yeah. But you know, again, being known or unknown is not the issue. It's about being aggressive and believing yourself. You have to believe in what you sell. You have to believe that what you have to offer is the best out there. Doesn't matter what anybody says. Doesn't matter what, no offense, what parents say. Doesn't matter what faculty says. Doesn't matter what anybody says. Because at the end of the day, you're the one living your life. You're the one that has to go out there and sell yourself. 
So you have to believe in that. Okay? Now obviously after that you have to get lucky as well. You have to, you have to understand, and that's for everybody. Be it, fat, be it music teachers wanting to become music teachers, performers or whatnot. You have to understand how uh, the schedule works. You have to know when organizations release the employment listings. They don't release them every day or every month. You have to know when presenters plan their seasons. And that you do by talking to them. You can go a school district and you can tell them, well, I graduated from uh, Carlo Christian and I'm interested in teaching choir. Do you have any openings? Well, they may not. They may tell you, I'm sorry, we don't. Uh, however, we may have one next year. Then you follow up. When next year? Do you have any ideas? No ideas, but normally our problems are posted such and such and such. Great. Can I stay in touch with you? Get back in touch with you in about six months to check on that? Absolutely. Or not. It all depends. You're aggressive, but you build a relationship. While staying respectful. Hope that answers your question. Uh, but that's, that's a big one. Being trusting yourself. Trusting yourself. If you don't, you lost. Make sense? Cool. Oh. Good, let me scroll on here a bit. Any questions while I'm scrolling on my files? Anybody? Anyone? No? No? Really? Really? No questions about none of that? Okay, all right, good, good. The last thing, and I know, I, I know I got about 30 minutes, but that's gonna take a bit of a discussion as well. Uh, let me go to my file here. Is the question of fees. And this is specifically when you wanna be a guest artist. What do you want you? Let me put it this way. What do you want to teach or be a music therapy or a performer? You're always also going to be performing on stage. And people are going to ask you, how much do you charge for your services? So that's a, that's a, for somebody that's not in the, used in the, that's not kind of used to this discussion, that's new to the business, it's kind of challenging, it's overwhelming because what do you say? Do you say a low number and then you're basically doing it for free? Or do you say a high number and then you lose it because they have somebody else for cheaper? So anybody has any idea before I give my answer? Anyone? Anybody? How do you talk to somebody about fees? Go. That allows me to drink as well. Are you talking about teaching or performing fees? Doesn't matter. Well, for me and my studio, I look at the market around me on what the general um, prices is that other teachers are um, asking, and then I match or better them or add things on top of that to make me distinctive above these other studios. So it's not just about price, but it's about um, that recitals are included or things like that. Okay, let me ask you to stay there, stay there, stay there, stay there. Stay there. You said you add things. Yes. As in to benefit the client. Yes. Okay. All right. Let me ask you this. Are you paying for the uh, per recital hall when you students do recitals? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. And that's one way to do it. That's one way. Uh, you're fine, you're fine. One, the, the most common way to come back to what you, the comment you made is to ask for parents. In the case of teaching private students, I'm assuming you're right, private. 
um, to ask for parents to contribute a certain amount for the performance hall. The way to do it is you take the total amount of that hall, whatever that is, and you divide by the number of students. That's going to play in that recital. And that's the amount. Simple as that. Why? Well, <laughs> you don't want for your parents to think that you're cheap. You don't want for parents to use you without paying the appropriate amount for your skills and talent. And you don't want for parents to think that whenever they need something done, you will do it for them. As far as fees goes. Okay? Now, and I hope that helps you a bit. You, you're, as far as, in my opinion, you're really on a tight rope on that area. In a sense that you have to, you have to charge your students what you think you're worth with in the area you live in. Okay? And then you can do, you can do discounts. You can do 10% off for families for two or more kids. You can do referral discounts. You refer two students, I'll give you two lessons for free. You know? But don't forget that as a teacher, as a private teacher, you have to pay your expenses. You have expenses, don't you? Between internet, between location where you teach, you have expenses. Who's covering those expenses? Not the parent. Unless you charge appropriately. So he's right, there is a difference between teaching and performing in that sense. But that's where you also have to have a red line. Draw a line in the sand, what are you going to accept and what you're not going to accept. Okay? That's very important. And, it, and for performance as well. And one of the ways to do that is simply ask, what's your budget? You don't know their budget. If you go to the school district, they may have an idea of their budget, maybe through the official reports, but you don't know, really. And then you formulate your demands as far as salary goes. Okay? Cool. I know I ran out of time. Any questions? Anybody? Okay. Cool. Last thing. A couple of, a couple of last things. A couple of books to help you out. So this book is called Beyond Talent. It's written by Angela Miles Pichy. She is the Director of Career Services at New England, Conservatory of Music. It's for everybody. Doesn't matter what you do. It goes over everything that we just talked about. Everything. Websites, social networks, programs. It talks about how to write a letter to a presenter or to an employer. So if you have a chance, go for it. Um, that's the first edition. The second edition is out as well. Uh, if you go on Amazon, you'll find them both. Okay? So it's called Beyond Talent. Find it, get it, it's very good. Uh, the next one. The Musician's Way. It is a practice guide, or oh, it's a guide on performance and practice by Gerald Klickstein. Uh, Klickstein is a guitar performer, and he is also a faculty at Peabody, where he's doing lectures, classes, and the um, He He's giving here uh, ways to maximize your practice. So why is that important? Well, guess what? Why are you busy self-promoting yourself as a teacher or as a performer? Guess what? You need to practice. 
You need to practice on a daily basis, hours and hours at a time. And I know you're all busy with all the classes and whatnot, but you have to find the time to practice. It's going to help you. It's going to help you organize your practice day in and day out. So check those out. Make sure you get them if you can. Um, and like I said, I know we're running out of time here. Um, yes. Sorry. Go ahead. In terms of the practice, so you know, talking about marketing, this is something they could be thinking about now as a student, but I'd be curious in hearing how you approached practice and balancing all that when you were a student, when you were in there. Shoes, what was your kind of a practice regimen? And would you recommend it? Ah, touchy subject, touchy subject. Very touchy. Let me just say this as a, as a you never have enough time to practice in a day. Never. Never. I know what you guys are going through because I did it. Music theory you one, two, three, four. History one, two, three, four. If you're not a pianist, keyboard skills, one, two, or whatever that is. There isn't enough time enough time to practice. There is not. Um, the way I did it um, back in my day, I would not recommend it to anybody. <laughs> um, for my bachelor years of Kansas, and same at TCU, by the way, my goal was the minimum GPA, 2.5. That's it. Because I'm a performer. That means I need time to practice. What it also means is that when I have the opportunity for electives, I took the easiest class available ever for my bachelor when we had our electives. Tennis, weightlifting, you name it. I did it all. Hey, I took French as foreign language. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, the reason for that is because the university, I'm sure they still do by the way, have me listed as born in Bulgaria. They never have me listed as living in France or speaking French. <laughs> hey! And of course I did a teacher back in the day. So, again, I don't recommend you to do it. Don't go do that. But, you know, practice when you're a student is very difficult. It's very challenging because you have to juggle 10,000 things. You have to juggle attending those types of events. You have to juggle attending whatever comes outside of uh, the university. You have to do papers for music history, music theory. Uh, what about the rehearsals and what are you doing? That's why you have to be very organized. Very. And when I say very organized, I mean minute by minute. What time do you wake up? What time do you eat breakfast? What time do you shower? What time are you supposed to be in class? Be there five minutes before. What time? Do you finish? Or how long does it take you to practice everything marked on a Google Calendar? Everything. And follow that to the letter. Because if you're not organized, guess what? Well, you're going to miss uh, assignments, which you don't want because your GPA is affected. Your scholarship is affected, especially if you fail your classes. So you don't want to miss assignments. You also don't want to miss practice time because guess what? Your private teacher, I mean, your university private teacher, they also expect you to do the correct job in practicing the pieces they assign you. Doesn't matter what it is. Same for Winsif. 
symphony, by the way. It's not because you're in an ensemble, or an orchestra, or in a choir, that you can slack it off. You have to practice, but you have to be organized. That's, the, that, that's a very big one as a chorus student. Organize yourself. Eat, sleep, and breathe. Organization. Simple as that. It's, it's very simple as that. Uh, and I know, so I know I said simple. It's not. But uh, you have to do that. All of that will come in time. All of that, you can do it can do it starting right now. But don't forget your focus at this very moment, which is what? To anybody? Graduate. <laughs> so you don't have to so you can focus on your careers, right? Right? Okay. So make sure whatever you do. You can start doing what we talked about today, right at this very minute. But don't lose the line. Your line goes by your degree. Okay? That's the... As much as it's been painful for me as far as my study goes, if you don't follow your education, your school's education policies, You're affecting yourself. Okay? So, whatever you do, follow the guidelines. Follow the guidelines. Get you to get your degree up. Then you can be full time. Just like me. I was doing concerts before 2008. But with the commitments to paperwork, music history, music theory, harmonica analysis, uh, you name it, I, you know, I couldn't do everything full time. But I needed to get out of it. So I needed to stay focused on my, on my classes as well. Does it make sense? Any questions? Anybody? No? Okay, very good. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you to the School of Music for hosting me, Professor Math. Mister. Thank you very much, I appreciate you all. Uh, if you guys want to talk to me, I'll be right outside. If you guys want to get one of, one of all my CDs, it's outside as well. Alrighty, I appreciate you all, thank you.